everyone. Welcome. I'm sweatshirting it tonight. It is our uh, mayoral forum. No, it's not. It's not really a forum. Just uh, thanks for joining me here. I just got off a phone call. I'm a little bit. I'm a little breathless because I was just having a big long conversation, and then a couple after a couple more long conversations, a lot of conversations that go in. Can you? Shh, shh, yeah, two beds. That way, diffuse. More like a diffuse thing. Yeah, that's great. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Close. Yeah. yeah. Just point it at the wall. There. Perfect. That's fine. Great. Thanks. Thank you. It literally does nothing. Yeah. No, it looks, I, think it's, I think it's great. Okay. It's too bright now. Now it's too bright. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Lighting. We're just working on lighting. Well, it has to be, look right. I mean, come on. All right. Well, it is. Uh, we do this every Tuesday and Thursday at. Uh, well, it's now 7 30. Uh, we're going to be doing this um, uh, live, these live opportunities for you to ask your questions and um, um, and to talk about your concerns about the city of La Crosse. And uh, please feel free to jump in, ask me questions. I will do my best to answer them, and I will uh, be sure to remember the things that are important to you so that we can address those when, well, when I become mayor, obviously. Um, and... Uh, yeah, feel free. Bring it on. I am more than ready. More than ready. I was noting today that uh, the, what is it called again? The Grand, uh, Grand Terrace? The Garden Terrace. Garden Terrace? I think it's what it's called. On the, the north side of La Crosse. I remember when this project first came up, and now this is that 50-unit uh, um, complex that is on Kane Street on the north side of La Crosse. And I remember when this was first being planned, and this was like, what, three years ago now? Three, three and a half, something like that. And the idea was to provide uh, homes for uh, previously homeless veterans, as well as some um, low-income housing, and then some uh, market-rate housing as well in this in this complex. And then and also put it in a floodplain, and also bring it out, uh, bring that property out of the floodplain, and do all of this somehow magically without, um, and 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 then and make it marketable, and and then do it without city dollars, and. People were scoffing at generally at this concept, and yet here we are, and it works. And they've just won some national awards for doing that very thing. And I am reminded of that conversation that we've been having constantly about um, about well, I have with others because it's important to me about homelessness and addressing homelessness in our community. And I I um, frequently have been hearing the skepticism about that the inability to provide housing first for those who are homeless in our community. And this is a, a thing that I point to and say, yeah, well, no, actually it can be done and it has been done in this way. It's been done in a way that it can be replicated. And it's not that we can build a I think it's garden terrace, I think. We can not build a garden terrace on every block. It's not possible, but what we can do is we can find unique and collaborative methods to engage our partners, whether they be federal partners, state partners, nonprofits, school districts, whatever the, whoever the stakeholders are, medical centers, the biggest employers, whoever they are, we can find ways to engage them to solve the issues that, are, that, are, that our community struggles with. And among those is helping our most vulnerable achieve and helping our most vulnerable find um, stability in our, in our city. I, um, I think that we can do that. I think it's something we should do, and I think that's something that I'm driven to do. I had shared something, I posted something on my website not long ago, and you can check that out at MitchReynolds.com. By the way, feel free to answer questions or ask questions right now, or if you have any concerns about the community, feel free to uh, to join in and let us see those. But I had posted something on my website previously about uh, about housing first, how I believe that housing first is the essential route that we need to take to get to um, to uh, helping to solve the, the issues of homelessness in our community. I do not believe that we can ever be done solving those issues. And unfortunately, I know this is not something that is popular to say, but we need to continue. This has to be something that we put as a priority for our communi community on an ongoing basis. We don't just find a solution to homelessness and and then and then be done. We have to continue to put resources into it because there's going to continue to be need in our community. So 
that is what that's what we have to do, and that's what I pledge to do. So, my point is is that the Garden Terrace is an excellent example of a collaborative effort to address previously homeless veterans in our community, their housing needs, find a way to to address that and um, and and uh, find a stability, a stable place for them to live. We did it there. We can do it again. There are other ways we can do that. I know there's a lot of skepticism. I know there's a lot of, well, we can't come up with it. you got to have mm, something. You know what? We can't have a single approach to this issue, just like every issue within the city of La Crosse or anywhere. There cannot be a single approach to, to solving homelessness for every individual within the city of La Crosse. There's got to be multiple ways to do it, and we will find those ways. So, uh, but I, I'm, I was pleased to see that uh, national awards for this uh, great development within the city of La Crosse because it's, uh, it is absolutely remarkable. I had a question. Oh, one of the great conversations that I had this today, as a matter of fact, was uh, listening to the, uh, the experience of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, coordinator for the South Side Nor and North Side Moms Groups in La Crosse. If you're like me, you may not have even known they, these existed. Well, they, they do. They do exist. As it turns out, there are groups of moms that were organized. I know it seems really simple, doesn't it? But groups of moms that were organized, and it's it's um, it's, it's there's not a, a limit on who can join these groups. But generally speaking, the the Southside group was organized with um, women of color, uh, single moms, basically women of color and um, women, white women with biracial children, and largely around the challenges that they faced within the community in any number of ways, including in schools. And it, it was, it, it started with this idea of, of women feeling separated, alone, isolated, and it wound up, uh, has turned into these organizations where women are advocates for not only their children, but their communities as well. And have been instrumental in helping the La Crosse School District help them help the La Crosse School District direct or change policies in many ways. It was a, such a great conversation and so inspiring to think about previously women who previously were not empowered to make change in their community suddenly given the ability or or seizing the ability to come together and organize and then make those changes. So great conversation, and I, if you have an organization that you feel has to, that you just feel like your message is not being heard, or you feel like your priorities are not being heard, or you don't even, don't even have to have an organization. I mean, I just want to hear from you, frankly. You, you, you know, you tell me, you can send me a message right now, but you can, you can message me anytime, you can, you can send me an email, um, Hey, go to my website at mitchreynolds.com. There's, there's phone numbers there. There's, uh, you can send me an email. That's, that's all good. Okay, so Chris asks, what are your thoughts on local government bolstering the health of families and children by helping parents become more effective and efficient with children? What are your thoughts on local government? Okay, so um, two parts to that answer. Well, first part of that answer is that um, the our public school districts are actually doing that. That's something that they are doing. Now, they may not be doing it always in the way that is the most effective. I mean, I don't, I'm not suggesting that that's always the case, depending on the school district. I mean, I, I feel like the, I, my kids went to La Crosse Public Schools. I feel like La Crosse Public Schools have been highly effective in a lot of different ways over the years. I think that in some ways there have been some um, some failures in the La Crosse School District to address the inequities in our in our community, either the socioeconomic inequities or the racial inequities. I think there's been failures within the La Crosse School District to adequately adequately address those issues. But in in a great respect, I do believe that there has been at least a significant amount of effort to empower parents to be well better parents. Now, I. In relation to city government, 
That's a really good question. I think that we start to stumble over ourselves if we have we have county government, if we have lacrosse school district, if we have if we have those organizations that are really working with the children on a regular and daily basis, if they're fulfilling those tasks and and city government suddenly jumps into gig as well, I'm not sure that we're necessarily going to be as effective. Um, the specialization isn't there necessarily. I do believe that city government does have a role to play with childhood development, however. And one of the most significant ways that we can do that is through the adequate funding and staffing of our libraries. If we want to look at ways to adequately develop our children or, or provide them an opportunity to work on their literacy and sometimes just to find a safe place, sometimes it's just a matter of sitting down in a safe place and having that ability to, you know, be in a place where it's, it's a process of opening a book and reading. City government has a place there. City government has a place when it comes to adequately providing play and park spaces for children. These are great outdoor spaces for our children to go to. A lot of children don't have yards, right? A lot of children don't have yards. A lot of children don't have places, good, safe places to play. One of the tremendous strengths about the city of La Crosse, and something that we should celebrate, is how our uh, what is it? 48 parks provide those spaces for the city's children. I think it's 48. Yeah, I believe it's 48 parks. That's a lot of park space. It's a fair amount of park space. And we should rejoice in that. We should celebrate that. But we should also make sure that we have those park spaces uh, available for children to use. And, you know, there's a lot of little things to that. But having the play equipment necessary and all that kind of stuff, and there's a lot, I mean, there's expenses to all this stuff. Don't get me wrong. I, don't, I understand that. And sometimes there has to be a funding queue. So you can't do everything at once and you have to, you can't replace all playground equipment at once and you can't, you can't rebuild all the parks at once, like uh, the Pogue Park. You can't suddenly make, take every hood park and turn it into a Pogue Park in the city. That's not going to happen. But we can do a lot. One of the things that are really beneficial in relation to parks is making sure the bathrooms are open. I know, small thing, right? <laughs> to make sure the bathrooms are open. It was one of the more frustrating things, and for those of you who experience this as a, as a parent, you know what I'm talking about. One of the most frustrating things that, that I would experience on a regular basis, going to the Lacrosse City Parks, when you go to the park, you go in the park on the weekend, you're gonna go play with your kids, you go to the park, you play with your kids, and you're tossing a Frisbee or a, Whatever it is you're, whatever it is you're doing that you're, you know, running around the park or, or playing, I don't know, tennis, tennis in quotation marks, because you know how that works when you have little kids, but playing tennis and and you go and 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 you and you have to then there's the bathroom and you go to the bathroom it's locked. That's not great. So a goal of a city. In relation, again, Chris, thanks for the question. And if you have questions, feel free to send me a message right now. I'm on Instagram over here, right here on Instagram, and over here on Facebook. So you can send me a message either way. Uh, feel free to jump in and join in and, um, and let me know your thoughts. But um, in relation to what the city can do uh, to, ab to be able to empower parents to become more effective and efficient, uh, in parenting, some of the key things that the city can do is be sure that there are effective places to play, that there are well-staffed and well-functioning libraries, that we have a public transit system that allows children to get from, you know, so you can go from safely from, from home to the park, right? Because that's, that's a normal thing that you do when you're a kid. Um, there's a lot of little things that city, city government can do to help empower parents to be better parents, to help our community be a stronger community, to help our children grow up in a stronger and healthier community. There's a lot we can do. So, Chris, thanks, thanks for that question. Uh, that's, but I, I don't think that the city takes over the role of, of the, the La Crosse School District. I don't think the city takes over the role of what the county does to assist parents and assist children in any number of different ways. I don't think that's the, the city's role in any kind of way. I think one of the city roles should be to make sure that we are not unnecessarily um, 
persecuting or prosecuting our children for um, in in criminal ways. I think we can do that. I think we can all agree that that's not healthy. So I'd like to see more of that. I'd like to, to see us address the racial inequities that exist in doing so. I think the city can do that um, in providing uh, adequate resources and doing it in a balanced manner so that we are addressing some of the racial and socioeconomic inequities in the city. I was so happy, I'm speaking of Polk Park, uh, I was so happy when that, for those of you who remember, Polk Park used to be Hood Park, and it was named after a guy who was a surveyor in the city. Um, so just a guy who signed his name on a sheet and they named the park after him. And it was, um, it wasn't that it's, it's in a, it was in a bad place or it was, it just was, it got, it was become dilapidated and had run down and then this, it wasn't really, there's nothing special about it, you know? And it was really a wonderful opportunity to be part of that process of, of turning that park into something special for the, for that Powell Pogue Hamilton neighborhood. And it's, so delightful to to go by there now and see well especially right now with the ice skating that's going on you go there now and there's there's like families just skating their butts off there's like pick up hockey games out there it's just amazing and there's kids it's winter and they're playing on the playground equipment it's absolutely it's just fantastic i love it so more of that let's do more of that so chris <laughs> more of that part of your question about uh, empowering parents to be uh, better, more efficient, and more effective parents. Uh, I One of the things I'm asked repeatedly is, uh, and this is a question that comes up for every uh, question, and this is actually, I think, is it, it? Yeah, I believe. So during this week, we had a another mayoral forum with all the candidates, and this one was on, it was recorded, and it will be played later on the radio station WYZM, uh, and that, like other forums, one of the key questions, why do you want to run, why, why are you running for mayor? What do you want to do? Why do you want to do this? And the answer is, is for depending on which candidate it is, I mean, it all boils down to, I want to help the city. And if you're not, if you're in it for like, you know, because you're, you think this is, you're stoking your ego, you're, you're doing the wrong thing. But generally, I like to believe, I like to believe that all 10 people who are running for mayor really are doing it because they want to help the city. Um, and not because they uh, like the attention that, <laughs> that comes from running for mayor. Because it's a really hard job. And if, uh, if, you, if you're not up for that, you're, boy, you're going to be in trouble. But one of the reasons that I, I want to run, one of the many, many reasons I am running for mayor and why I want to be mayor in the city of La Crosse is because I'd like to see more uh, I'd like to see more examples of of victory uh, of of a of a of neighborhood growth and development and community building, like like Polk Park. I'd like to see more of that, and I'd like to be able to do that. And it was in speaking with the uh, organizer for the South Side North Side Moms group today, it was very clear that there's a lot of more, there's just way more opportunities for that. We can do so much more within the city and we can do so much more to address the, again, issues of racial inequity and social inequity, but also we can find ways to really sink our teeth into being a model of sustainability as a small Midwestern city. It, seems like that in some ways seems so remarkably unachievable and yet incredibly achievable all at the same time. To be completely carbon neutral, say by 2030 in 10 years, you're nuts, no way we can do that. Oh, I think, kind of think we can. And it, that sense, that belief, that uh, feeling that we can not only model this incredible behavior, but make our community better at the same time and make ourselves, make our, our, our lives healthier and our homes healthier at the same time is, is just tremendous. 
Had a great conversation with a gentleman last night. He has just moved to the community. He and his wife are scientists. They've just moved to this community. And uh, they've uh, written a couple books. And I, I, looked, I looked them up. And it really, it's fascinating stuff. And it's all about hydrolo hy uh, hmm. hydrology. Hydrology. Yeah, we'll go hydrology. It's something like hydrology. Uh, <laughs> but a lot more to it than that. But uh, water. It's about water. They write about water. And we were, got into this discussion about the PFAS contamination on French Island. And, you know, that, how that's going to have to be addressed by, by somebody. And frankly, I, I, I hate to say this as, because I'm sure that the city attorney is cringing right now. If he, once he hears this, or, um, or anybody in the city attorney's office are going to cringe when they hear this get played back. But um, I, it feels like the city of La Crosse has a responsibility to the people in the town of Campbell that are affected by PFAS contamination to make sure they have fresh water. And not just bottled water, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, we're talking pipe the water out there for these people to drink. Because as I was talking to the scientist, um, this toxicologist, who had just moved to this community, and, and we were talking about the impacts of that PFAS contamination on the groundwater and how that has really rendered those homes that those people live in basically worthless. If you get your water from a well and you can't drink the water, what value does your home have? Essentially, I mean, it's not nothing, but it's almost nothing. So there is a culpability, there's a liability there, and it's important that we address that now, but also address how we can mitigate those in, uh, things from happening in the future. We have to be able to wrap our minds around the concept of strategizing so that we don't run into these problems in the future, we don't create future liabilities by the actions that we take now. That is essential. You know, that's part of strategic risk management. That's one of the things that I specialize in and um, that I'm bringing to the table. But it's also part of just being a damn good human being. You, you, don't, you don't create situations where people have poison water in the future. So the PFAS contamination, um, this gentleman's expertise, uh, he and his wife were actually moved here to work on nitrate contamination, which is another, whole nother thing, whole nother issue, but something certainly we can work on as well. I know we've dipped down the road of sustainability, environmental protection, and, and uh, uh, writing uh, social inequities uh, during this half hour, but these are incredibly important for me these are incredibly important things to address in order to make sure that we are serving the most vulnerable members of our society, of our community, while at the same time focusing on the very real problems that we have facing us right now in relation to making sure that we are pursuing a path that will help our small businesses and our families and every other individual recover from the pandemic and the recession. We have a long recovery ahead of us. In fact, we have a, we're not, maybe not even being ready to be in that recovery right now, as a matter of fact. We got a long ways to go. So focusing on all of that and then balancing that against the needs to make sure that our children are, have access to libraries, our children have access to, uh, to parks and recreation, that our, uh, that we are focused on sustainability, that we're making certain that we are not we are not ruining our children's future with environmental contaminations that we can't or don't or don't feel like we shouldn't have to clean up or whatever that situation is. Making sure that we can do all those things is going to be an incredibly tough balancing act. And the truth, I was told tonight, you need to reach out to people. You got to reach out to people and talk to people. Oh man, I want to talk to you. I want to make sure I'm listening to all the voices and understanding all the concerns. So again, uh, as always, feel free to reach out to me. There's, I, you can send me a direct email. It's mitchreynoldsformayor.com, uh, at gmail.com. Mitch Reynolds for the number four, mitchreynoldsformayor at gmail.com. If you go to my website, mitchreynolds.com, there's, uh, there's an email link there. You can also, there's a phone number there. Feel free to call at any time, and I will do my best to, to answer your, your concerns. I've had a lot of people who have who have sent me messages wanting to know um, more about some positions about, uh, the, well, the Southside Library, that came up. Somebody asked me about that. What do you think about the Southside Library keeping that open? I, 
I'm I feel that we as this com this community can support our three library branches. I, I believe that. I believe that we can also collaborate with our partners, our regional partners, to ensure that we have that our libraries remain um, adequate and functional and serving the region and not just the city of La Crosse. As you probably know, and if you're living in one of these surrounding communities, you probably have been to a library in La Crosse. These are resources for this entire region. And I would love to be able to cost share on that. That would be fantastic. Seeking regional partners now, let's do that because that's a great idea. But uh, we can we can do that, and 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 we can, um, and 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 making sure that our our parks are in good shape for our kids and that we have everything. We can open as much as we can so that we can provide as many city services as we can, and. Uh, uh, and include that includes the South Side, uh, the South Branch Library. I mean, those are those are essential parts of our community, and we need to we need to maintain them. So, uh, again, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to go to my website, MitchReynolds.com, and ask your questions there. Call me, email me, whatever you'd like to do. If you, by the way, I still have signs available. If you'd like to have a sign in your yard, reach out. Give me a holler. We will, uh, I'll be happy to hook you up. Coming up next week, you'll, I think, I don't really know what the schedule is, but I think that WIZM is, is airing that recorded forum that we had the other night. It, it's kind of split into two nights, so I think you have to commit a couple hours to listening to all the candidates, so... There's a number of opportunities. I think the La Crosse Tribune had some questions to the mayor, uh, for the mayors in it today. There's a lot of places where you can get viewpoints from all the mayoral candidates, so I encourage you to do that as well. Well, anyway, that's our time for tonight. Thanks so much for stopping by. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Let's get to work.